<laughs> Let's bring in Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host. And uh, this is such an important topic. Mike joining us from vacation to talk about this. The last vacation you're going to have until after the Super Bowl. All right. Let's start with Saquon Barkley. The latest report, Giants offered $13 million. He wants $16 million. Can they settle somewhere in between and this all goes away? Well, one thing to remember, Dan, that offer of $13 million was made before they applied the franchise tag to Saquon Barkley. What they wanted to do was get him signed long-term and tag Daniel Jones. When that didn't work, they signed Daniel Jones, tagged Saquon Barkley, and pulled their offer. So back before the tag was applied, it was 16, I'm told, that Barkley wanted, 13 that the Giants were offering. And neither number is unreasonable. I know Barkley claims it's all a lie. I mean, it's not like it's 26 and 23 that are out there. These are realistic numbers that he should want. Now the question is, what do the Giants do when they know they have his rights for this year at 10.1% and they could squat on him next year at just a 20% raise. Total payout of $22.22 million over two years if they want to go year to year under the tag. That's what the Giants have in their pocket. All Barkley has is the threat to not show up. Yeah. And the problem is the deadline for doing a long-term deal is Monday. After Monday, they can't do a long-term deal. They can only do a one-year deal. So now is the time for Barkley to huff and puff because after Monday, he's got no real leverage because he can't get a long-term deal. He's got leverage, but he's not using it for anything because nothing he says or does will get him that long-term contract after Monday. Now's the time to make his play. Paulie has a suggestion on how we get running backs paid. Paulie, you... Let Mike be the judge? Yeah. Okay, Mike, this is what I would want if I were running backs and the NFLPA. When running backs are drafted out of college, especially first-round running backs, their contract is three years. Not No option for the fourth, no fifth. Right now, it's four with an option for a fifth, which is... Very team-friendly, like Saquon has had five years. So their first contract, especially for first-round running backs, is three years, which gets them to their second contract possibly two years earlier, makes them more valuable and more likely to sign. This is what I'd want if I were running backs and the NFLPA. I think you're absolutely right. And look, you can make the argument the running backs should have their own bargaining unit. They shouldn't be part of the NFL Players Association. They should have their own separate thing, their own separate deal. And that was tried a few years ago. It went nowhere. But you can make the argument that the running backs should be on their own, their own group. An argument and a suggestion that Chris Sims initially threw out there several months ago, and I've been pushing it, the idea that that there should be a league-wide fund that's available to pay running backs early in their careers as they're producing. Because the the best running backs are, are, boom, right away. They're automatic. They're obvious. They're great. And then... By the time they're due to get paid, they've they've worn a lot of uh, of the the you know the rubber off the tires, and and teams are thinking we'll just go draft another one. So I'd like to find a way to get guys paid as they earn, as they perform, as they produce. But again, you got to get the union on board, you got to get the league on board. That's the biggest challenge: getting the powers that be to recognize it's an issue that needs to be addressed, and hopefully they eventually will. Well, we brought this up uh, a couple of years ago that maybe we have quarterbacks who are treated separate. So it's separate cap for your quarterback because that's where all the money is going. And then therefore you have more resources to spend on the rest of the team. And then maybe running backs do get compensated. But if a quarterback's going to make 50 or $60 million, then maybe you don't have, you know, the Giants. What, what, what they did with Daniel Jones is idiotic in my opinion. Because they could have gotten him for a whole lot less. Didn't you know there was no leverage there? Uh, but I'm wondering if we could do that—a a salary cap for quarterbacks. Consider this: when the schedule comes out, all the great games are driven by the quarterbacks, and they completely reshuffle the deck based upon is Tom Brady retired? Is Tom Brady not retired? They admit that they did that in 2022. He retired from the Buccaneers. Okay. Who cares about Tampa Bay games? Oh, wait, now he's back. we got to jam Tampa Bay games into primetime. It shows you how valuable quarterbacks are, not just to their team, but to the entire production. So if we're going to talk about league-wide funds, you know, and this is one of the ways they hold Patrick Mahomes down, and he's content with it because he wants to win. But Patrick Mahomes is far more valuable than $45 million per year to the game, 
not just to the Chiefs, but to the Shield and to every game they put on and all the money they're bringing in. The great quarterbacks are always going to be woefully underpaid and subsidize everyone else in a salary cap system. So you're on to something. But again, the league's got to be willing to do it. <laughs> the union's got to push it. And good luck getting either of those things to happen. How does the NFL, I'm trying to figure out the best way to describe this, ask, force, encourage the Jets to be on hard knocks? Well, they came up with a rule 10 years ago or so where you're exempt if you have a first-year head coach, you have been to the playoffs each of the last two years, and or if you've done hard knocks the last 10 years. So there were four teams this year that fell into the category of teams that couldn't say no. The league decided collectively there will be teams that can't say no. This year it was the Bears, the Saints, the Commanders, and the Jets. And the Jets didn't want to do it. I mean, this is the first time in the history of hard knocks you're getting a team that didn't want to do it. And if you want reality TV, that's reality. Well, can a they team that can they want to do it? Yeah, can they? That's what I'd love to see. If hard knocks is there, but they don't cooperate with hard knocks. Well, and I think at some point they're just going to have to. They're going to have to submit to it. It's going to be harder to fight it than to just acknowledge the cameras are here and this is going to be a distraction. Dan, I think the biggest problem is this. Whoever makes the decisions about what the Jets are going to allow into the final program had better be damn sure Aaron Rodgers is okay with anything involving him because they may guess wrong and then they got a problem with Aaron Rodgers and the honeymoon is over just like that. I would want Rodgers sitting there watching the final cut and giving me up or down on anything he likes or doesn't like. That's the only way to avoid a problem. And I think that's one of the reasons they don't want to do it, because they could get sideways with Aaron Rodgers. Remember when they did it the last time there was that scene where Antonio Cromartie couldn't remember the names of his kids? And, and the Jets let that go in. I know. I, know. I mean, the, the, the teams, we learned that years ago, the teams have final say over this. Well, they better exercise it in a way that doesn't offend the delicate genius known as Aaron Rodgers. He's Mike Florio. <laughs> Your love affair continues with, uh, <laughs> with Aaron Rodgers. Pro Football Talk Live co-host and uh, contributor, NBC Football Night in America. Summarize this ESPN expose on Daniel Snyder and John Gruden and his law, John Gruden's lawsuit here. Well, you know, the headline is that the release of the John Gruden emails was the first domino that led to Daniel Snyder being forced to sell. But if you're following the story carefully, you already knew that. He was free and clear. It was over. It was done. The wrist slap had been administered to Dan Snyder. The investigation report had been brushed under the rug. It was over. When the Gruden emails came out and he got forced out of a job, that dusted everything up again. Congress got involved. And then one thing leads to another and Snyder sells. The bigger issue is the John Gruden lawsuit over who leaked the emails. Now, John Gruden is not going to be a sympathetic figure because he wrote the emails. And many will say he got what he deserved. But when you have a stack, a gigantic stack, Dan, of 650,000 emails and a small handful of them get pulled out and weaponized to take a guy out, someone decided we're going to take these emails out of this stack, we're going to give them to the media, and we know what's going to happen. Mark Davis is not going to be able to continue to employ him. That's where this whole thing blows up. And this gets back to the fight. Every time the NFL gets sued, they try to pull it into arbitration where they can keep it all secret and they can stack the deck in their favor. And that's where Gruden's case is still hung up more than a year later. Is it going to be in open court or is it going to be in the NFL's private arbitration system? And if it's in open court, yeah. John Gruden gets the chance, Dan, to go all the way back down the digital rabbit hole. Who ultimately was the one that forwarded the email to the Wall Street Journal first, the New York Times second? He's going to find out. And one of the quotes that really got my attention in that story, he wants to burn the NFL's house down. Now, that doesn't mean the whole game. He means the league office. He wants to take out Roger Goodell. He wants to take out Dan Snyder if he can, if it turns out Snyder was the one that leaked the emails. And Dan, if Snyder was the one, he may, he may have to worry about a prosecution because he, under oath, testified to Congress he didn't do it. If Gruden proves he did, there's going to be a perp walk. There's going to be a trial. <laughs> there's going to be incarceration of Mike, Daniel Snyder. Mike, this is better than hard knocks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, who's more likely to get signed first, Dalvin Cook or D. Hopkins? Good question. And anytime someone says good question, that means they're just buying time to come up with an answer. <laughs> I, I think that it's probably going to be Dalvin Cook because I think Cook sees the benefit 
of getting into camp early and getting himself ready. Hopkins is a guy whose reputation is he doesn't like to practice. So why not wait two, three, four weeks? Maybe somebody gets injured. Maybe somebody ends up being not as effective as they were supposed to be because he's waiting for another team to drive up the offer that the Titans and the Patriots have made. So I think it's going to be Cook before Hopkins. Andrew Luck, Hall of Famer, question mark. God, no. I mean, I know it's slow now. I mean, I, I saw Wait, that. wait, wait. Who brought this up? There's a there's an NFL Rookie Watch Twitter account that just kind of dropped it out there. Oh, his first six seasons were insane. And, you know, Hall of Fame eligible in 2024. Well, we are too. But we ain't getting in and he ain't getting in. <laughs> so, I mean, it just – it's uh, – it's his prerogative to walk away. But do we look at the quarterbacking position the way we did the running back position with Terrell Davis and Gail Sayers? Well, but Terrell Davis won a Super Bowl and Gail, or two, and Gail Sayers had rare, unprecedented talent. The problem with the quarterback position is there's so many great ones. I mean, if Andrew Luck gets in, Phillip Rivers is in, it's a no-brainer. Eli Manning, it's a no-brainer. He's getting in anyway because his last name's Manning and he's got two Super Bowl wins. But, you know, you could look at aspects of his career and say it's a closer call than it should be. But if Andrew Luck gets in, look at all the guys currently playing who have a better case right now than Andrew Luck. So I don't think Andrew Luck would want to get in. I think he's sufficiently self-aware to realize that's part of the price of walking away at the front end or smack dab in the middle of your prime. He chose to not play. Why would he expect? I don't think he'd ever expect to be in the Hall of Fame. He could still come back, I guess, and put enough more years on paper to get into the Hall of Fame. But based on what he did before he chose to retire, it's, I think it's one thing. to have, And he could say, well, his, his career was shortened by injury. And maybe it was. But still, he chose to walk away when he could have kept playing. And, and I, don't, I don't know how you get rewarded with a bronze bust for doing that. And at that position where it's about numbers – I don't know if you could have a scenario. Could somebody create a body of work in six years, first six years, that they got injured and weren't able to play again, that the voters would look at that and say, you know what, Hall of Fame worthy? If you win Super Bowls. If you win Super Bowls. There, there are people in the Hall of Fame that wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame but for their Super Bowl wins. Lynn Swan would not be in the Hall of Fame True. but for his role with the Steelers, four Super Bowl teams, and his performance in Super Bowl X, which showed us all the way the wide receiver position could be played if the ball is put in the air more often. And I'm sure that was part of this process where we've seen the game evolve toward the pass. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, let's say Lamar Jackson won two Super Bowls and then his career ended. He got injured. He's in. Okay. in. okay. I think getting the Super Bowls is in. That's why Terrell Davis made it. The Super Bowl victories put you on a higher level than, than just being great in the regular season. Is Russell Wilson a Hall of Famer right now? Well, no. I mean, you could make the argument he's got a better chance of getting in if he would retire now than if he keeps playing. Because as he keeps playing, <laughs> yeah. if he struggles like he did last year, that drags him down. And it makes it harder. It takes away from the resume he'd already put together. Shereen mm -hmm. Williams, who's one of the Hall of Fame voters, made the point late in Eli Manning's career. He's running the risk of hanging around so long, it's going to disqualify him from the Hall of Fame because he's going to have too many bad years on the back end of his good years. Now, I think Russell Wilson's got the potential to be like Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner had that donut hole the, the year he was with the Giants and, and his final years with the Rams. It, it dipped, but then he picked it up again. But I still think Russell Wilson's done enough already to get there. The question is, does he diminish himself with his play this year and beyond? That's going to be the real yeah, question. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I would keep him out of the Hall of Fame just for the Subway sandwich commercial. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know, the first time I saw it, Mike, I thought somebody accidentally aired something that shouldn't have been on TV where he's just chewing on a sandwich and talking to you. And I go, this cannot be real. I thought it was a bit. I thought it was like some SNL thing where they got him to do something that was supposed to be funny. It was so unintentionally hilarious. Mike, thanks for joining us from your vacation. Good seeing you, Dan. All right. That's Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host.